Really happy to be here today. Um, share some of this. Thank you uh, to Nanopor for having the FDA in. We are excited users of the technology. And uh, I'd like to show you, uh, if I could, how we would frame how we actually uh, use the technology, how we anticipate using the technology, and how long read sequencing technology like Oxford Nanopore's technology is really hugely complementing our sort of global food safety sequencing effort, if you will. So thank you. So we're moving forward, uh, you know, we're trying to take food safety into the 21st century. In doing so, it's mostly genomics that we're trying to get out in front. Uh, it has a lot of advantages, right? Genomic sequencing can be one analyte that can tell you many, many things about a bacteria. It can tell you about its virulence. It can tell you about its drug resistance. It can tell you lots of different things. So, so we're excited to have it uh, out in front right now. And yes, while in some areas it's still quite researchy, uh, there are other areas where we actually have real regulatory pipelines and workflow already set up with whole genome sequencing and bioinformatic pipelines. So, so we're very excited about it. I will tell you, um, excuse me, it's a, you would, it's a very simple vision at the FDA, right? We don't have a very complicated mission statement. We have a very straightforward mission statement. The mission statement is safe, wholesome, and sanitary foods for everyone. And uh, you would think that with such a simple vision statement that uh, our work might be straightforward, but it's not straightforward at all. It's uh, quite challenging, actually. And as you know, uh, right now, just this week, uh, we have, are still battling hemorrhagic E. coli and certain elements of the romaine lettuce industry here in the United States. And it's, uh, it's making people uh, very uncomfortable, and rightfully so. so. So there's always a challenge. There's always an outbreak that's going on that we're trying to solve. And actually sequencing is, is really paramount in helping find solutions to that problem. So the way that I like to think of it is that if you think of outbreak investigations, foodborne outbreak investigations are a three-legged stool, right? Uh, when something happens, it's kind of like a plane crash. You can think of an outbreak like a plane crash. People want to know what exactly happened, what went wrong, and how do we fix it. Uh, one way is through epidemiology, which is a very important leg of the stool. The other is through traceback, where people actually do what, what we call the shoe leather investigation. People walk back through bills of lading and distribution centers and are looking for actually the flow of a contaminated food through industry. And then, of course, where I come in and where our group, our laboratory comes in, is through the laboratory support of all this. And if, if, if you watch CSI and you're a big fan of the CSI TV shows, then you know that, of course, at the end of the show, forensic data has always saved the day and has given everybody the solutions that they need to all their problems and everything gets wrapped up into a neat bow. I wish I could tell you that were the case always in solving outbreaks for foodborne illness. However, I will say that moving from older, uh, more crude techniques like pulse field gel electrophoresis into more modern techniques like whole genome sequencing is actually getting us closer to being able to always contribute to that investigation, to be able to provide insight and inference that we never had before. And so I'll show you a little bit of how that works. Um, before, when food, a contaminated food with E. coli, say E. coli laden romaine lettuce or something would enter commerce, uh, and then uh, you wouldn't find the first illnesses for about a week or so after it entered commerce. And those illnesses then have to go to their doctor and report their illness and the doctor will take a test and see if they have E. coli infection. And then from there, the doctor will report, by law, they have to report that infection to the state health department. And then the state health department will report it to the Centers for Disease Control. And then the CDC, if it's foodborne, will call the Food and Drug Administration. So by the time we get involved, me, myself, my colleagues like Mark and Aaron Narhal here, by the time we get involved, we're already down four weeks or longer, almost five weeks into an outbreak. And so, we're missing all this illness and it's also missing the opportunity to find the smoking gun because lettuce doesn't last forever. Tomatoes don't last forever. So, so this is a, a problem. What whole genome sequencing has done for us immediately is put us on an even playing field with the epidemiological investigation so we can move forward in parallel with a whole genome sequence based investigation here that's often regulatory and it can go hand in hand with epidemiology, making sure that while the epidemiologists are collecting their information, we're also collecting forensic information about the pathogen, about the foods, and tracing it back 
to potential sources in the environment. And that's been such a huge help. And there are many reviews now that show uh, how many adjusted life years, how much money in the industry and how it's really benefiting in so many ways. Um, the other way that it helps are ways that are overcoming this problem that we have now in modern society where we have complex uh, etiology of foods, right? Today, we had a lunch here that's not unlike this. You can have four or five ingredients in your salad any given time from four or five states in, the, in America. You can have other ingredients from nearby adjacent countries like Mexico. Um, sushi is notorious for coming, having ingredients from all over the world at any given time. And even something as simple as a fruit and cheese platter, uh, e if eaten this time of year, that fruit won't be from here. A lot of that fruit will be from outside US borders. So you can see you could have five or six countries uh, donating the fruit and maybe three or four countries donating the different cheeses. So it's a very complicated food supply now. And because it's complicated, uh, being able to have a high discriminatory forensic tool to help link genomes from, from pathogens back together to provide that important inference is what we're happy about. And so this is another example of where it's overcoming that. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but at the end of the day, I would argue, and many of us would argue, that whole genome sequencing has been to food safety, what the Hubble telescope has been to uh, modern astronomy. It's been absolutely nothing short of amazing. Well, we started out with plating back in the 60s. That's all we had was a pure morphology. And then in the 70s, we got into biotyping and food sources to discriminate strains. And in the 70s and 80s, serotyping became more popular. And then in the 90s, we started PulseNet, right? PulseNet was the first DNA-based fingerprinting tools for subtyping, very important. And then, uh, of course, in the last 10 years, we're very excited because now whole genome sequencing has supplanted PFGE. I sent an official email across the agency last March, this past March, uh, notifying all the field laboratories of the Food and Drug Administration to stand down their pulse field gel laboratories and to proceed only with whole genome sequencing of foodborne pathogens. So that felt really good. That was a nice email to send. Um, one of the things that has come from this, from a lot of the sequencing we've done, is we realize that we shouldn't be the only ones benefiting from these data. We can get these data in a way that not only can our data help others and be part of a larger global community for data sharing, but also if others could join a common network, then we could actually benefit from the sharing in both directions. So we would have data from participating countries, from industry, uh, from universities and academics who also are interested in sharing data. And so in 2012, in late 2012, uh, we put together what's called the Genome Tracker Network. The Genome Tracker basically is a very simple model. Everybody sequences enteric pathogens and foodborne pathogens. The sequences uh, are deposited at one of our three global database sites, which all share in real time either at NCBI here in the United States, EMBL or EBI in Europe, and the DNA databases of Japan. All of these places uh, in real time upgrade and share their data. So if you put it in one database, it will be present in the other two by sundown. So it's a, a very helpful global model. And, uh, and, and so in doing, then if you're a public health practitioner, or if you're interested, you don't have to be. You can be a professor, you can be anybody, an attorney, uh, or just a concerned citizen. You want to look at genome data? You are free to look at genome data. It's all there publicly available with minimal metadata at your disposal at NCBI. Uh, one of the things that has really made our network very successful uh, in terms of public health and tracking foodborne illness has been this mix, this combination of adding clinical samples to the database, which our colleagues from the CDC add through their PulseNet USA connection versus the food and environmental isolates coming out of the genome tracker. And that would be from us, the US Department of Agriculture, also doing all the foods that they regulate. And we put together them in, in the database. And of course you get this nice sweet spot in the middle. And this is where you get that maximum benefit because if you've got clinicals and you've got food and environmentals, you can now see whether they're making people sick and you can see a real time calendar of how much illness is happening and when. And so that's been extremely helpful. It's a very powerful approach for all of our public health agencies to be moving forward with. One of the things is you remember is that making networks like this costs a lot of money. And of course, lab, it takes labs to generate data. It takes a network administration and management, which costs money. 
And then it takes this massive curation effort, right? To, to QA, to house, to store, and to provide the analytical tools to have access to that data for the world. That costs a lot of money. But luckily for us, uh, there was an agency in the United States government that was already doing this, right? At the National Institutes of Health, the National Library of Medicine has been curating DNA sequence data since I was an undergraduate in the 80s. And so uh, some of my first master's thesis DNA sequences are in the GenBank database at NCBI. And so we approached GenBank at NIH and they liked the project and they have been original partners and they curate and they do all the storage and all the analysis. They provide front end user analysis uh, for the last seven years. And so they've been a huge partner and, uh, and that gave us a lot more money to buy more sequencers and to do better network management because we didn't have to spend it on any of this because we have a partner in government who's doing it already. So that was extremely helpful. So right now, the role of whole genome sequencing in our investigations is pointing to sources of contamination, defining the scope of a contamination or an outbreak event, uh, proving whether or not we have good cleaning or sanitation protocols in industry at any given time, and providing a piece of information used for regulatory action, including root cause, which is something now we can start to get a handle on. What's the original cause behind an outbreak? What's the original reservoir of the pathogen? Where did it come from? So that's helping a lot. We interpret these data now in regulatory environments all the time. We've got a number of papers which show how many SNPs generally means you're included in an outbreak versus how many SNPs actually show you that you're not part of an outbreak. So there's lots of papers you can read about it uh, moving forward. Uh, but one of the great powers of it has been really learning about whether a pathogen is set up harborage inside a facility or whether a pathogen is just sporadic and passing through a facility. And you can see, of course, if you get the diff a different genome from the environment coming through, on the other side of it, you will see different genomes as they emerge. However, if it's a persistent problem or a harborage problem in a facility, which is the worst kind of scenario, that's the one you really got to crack down on quickly. Uh, you will see the same genome again and again and again coming out the other side. And that's, that's one very quick way that industry will actually use the technology to see if they have a harborage problem or whether they have a supplier problem. So it comes in very handy for that. Uh, getting back to the reason for this meeting and why it's very important, of course, is the long read sequencing technology or third generation sequencing technologies, which are extremely helpful. Um, we have, I have here with us a Narhal, Dr. Narhal Gonzalez. He's brought this to the laboratory. He's one of our principal investigators and he's developing it in ways and applying it in ways that we think will be game changing for our environmental microbiology program. And I'll show you some of that. Uh, why we would like to use long read sequencing? We can get high quality reference genomes. We can learn more about long-term evolution. Uh, we can very quickly use, look at the virulence situation and do in silico virulence typing. Uh, we can look very quickly at drug resistance, mobile elements, plasmids, and all the things associated with pathogens. And then lastly, we can learn even about DNA modifications and how that makes a bug or a pathogen actually more deadly. So I'll show you a little more on that in just a moment. Closing bacterial genomes clearly requires long reads, and we are very excited about the Oxford Nanopore tool to help us do that. So one of the great applications for us is environmental micro. When there's an outbreak of, food, of produce or vegetables or fruit, we often go back into the environment to try to understand what happened. Every single person who ever got involved in one of these before we had genomics, always like to say, it's the seagulls. It's always the seagulls. If I heard, how many times I heard somebody say, it's the seagulls there, just go find all the, you'll find it in the seagulls. So for some, these, these unfortunately, that go by the nickname rats with wings, uh, may not be so deserving of their reputation. So I'll show you, very rarely has it ever really been the seagulls. So we had a huge event that happened in the, uh, in the past few years on the Delmarva Peninsula here on the East Coast in the Mid-Atlantic. They grow all the tomatoes that feed the United States every year to, all the way to the Mississippi River. Uh, they, there was a recurrent salmonella event that kept coming back season after season. And everybody wanted to say, it's the seagulls. It's gotta be the seagulls. Well, we went out and we did a long-term environmental survey and we found out that it wasn't the seagulls, it wasn't any other animals in the area, it wasn't the actual produce or the native vegetation, it wasn't even any of the machines or equipment on the farms. 
It turns out the one thing that kept coming back again and again and again positive was the water. It was always in the water. It just intrinsically seemed to exist in the water. And when we used whole genome sequencing, we were able to link the water isolates back to all the clinical illnesses so that we showed that the water was really a long-term reservoir for salmonella, which in this region of the country has adapted to life in surface waters. And, that's, and so you can find it there year round, 12 months a year living in there. So the idea was then linking it back to clinical illnesses, finding the actual outbreak strains using whole genome sequencing allowed us to then intervene, find out what was, how the water was being used that was getting it onto the tomatoes and with the proper guidance and new policies for growers, um, we haven't had an outbreak in tomatoes since 2014. But I only whisper it because I have to, you don't want to say things like that too loud when you're in the food safety business. Since 2014. So, so it seems to be helping a lot. And it's one example. We're now doing the same thing out west with, with leafy greens like lettuce and E. coli, which have a very similar issue that we're trying to understand. Uh, we've done these water surveys now up and down the East Coast. We have a huge, all of these isolates too, as we get them, immediately get sequenced and get put into the database, the genome tracker database. So all these isolates are there, all their genomes. So for the future, how nice will it be when we can have an instrument that we can take with us on these environmental surveys? This is the lab in a backpack concept. And Oxford Nanopore is uniquely positioned to help us with the lab in a backpack because it fits in a backpack and very few other sequencers actually ever fit in a backpack. So it's very easy to work with, it's very portable and Narhal is actually doing pilot studies right now with environmental samples out from the West uh, to see how it performs. I know the uh, MK1C is coming soon, but uh, we know it's here and uh, we're looking forward to full availability of that. That is very slick. Uh, Ian was just showing me that in some detail. So, so we're excited about this concept of being able to take sequencing with us on the road. The other great power, of course, is at some point, we're not going to want to fuss with an isolate. We're not going to want to try to plate bacteria out, get an isolate off a Petri plate. We're going to want these data to come to us directly from genomics. So metagenomic sequencing directly out of environmental samples is where we're headed at the FDA. And that's something that's very important for us. It will save time, it will save money, and it will save lives because it'll give us answers more quickly. And we have some pilot data. We've started a database off the genome tracker called Metagenome Tracker, uh, which our colleagues in the center are, are, are actually growing very quickly uh, with a lot of these data sets. So we think the Oxford Nanopore will play a key role in a lot of our metagenomics field work going forward as well. Uh, at the end of the day, genomics right now is helping us uh, define what's in each of these boxes. We can answer, do you have a pathogen? What kind of pathogen is it? Is it part of an outbreak? This is the order you gotta go when you're looking at an outbreak. Right now, whole genome sequencing tells us the last two boxes. It works, but with metagenomics comes online and it's fully validated, which may take another five years, I'm not sure, but when it is, then it'll be a complete game change, complete workflow change. We'll be able to answer all three boxes now with single genomic reactions, which is where we wanna be. So where else are we going with genomics? That, there's other value in genomics, intrinsic into genomic data that we want to you know, harvest. And for instance, we know that salmonella has adapted to live in very different environments, in the foods, in the industry, in fields, in natural settings. Many of these things are listed here. Here's 34 different ad adaptations that salmonella has that make it very difficult to treat or combat in a facility. Using genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, we can identify these adaptations much more quickly. And in borrowing the words of Martin Weedman, a professor and colleague from Cornell who does a lot of sequencing, knowing these adaptations for the pathogens that have infected or, or, or contaminated a facility or a farm will allow us to have precision food safety. Because not only will we know that you have salmonella, we'll be able to say, you have salmon salmonella strain XYZ, and it has resistance to these quat ammonium compounds, resistance to these antibiotics, and it has these adaptations that make it internalize in your product. So we're gonna do precision food safety in the next few years. And that's gonna be a huge step forward for us uh, coming out of the adaptations program. From that, here's one example. 
Salmonella borreli. We found this harborage in a tuna, in yellowfin tuna uh, out of India. The yellowfin tuna caused an outbreak in 2013 in sushi. Uh, this is one of the few outbreaks that I actually got caught up in personally. I like tuna, spicy tuna sushi. It was big in Maryland and I actually got sick. And my isolate is in the database. So it turns out this thing has an adaptation that we never saw before. It's got a, it's got a resistance island to arsenic and other heavy metals uh, that we've never seen in salmonella. And this of course would be consistent with life in a top apex predator like tuna in the ocean where they're exposed to heavy metals all the time. So these are things that we never thought about that we're now seeing in these pathogens that is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, virulence is one of the last things that's so very important. In the spirit of this week with the E. coli events that are happening in the US, uh, we, this is an E. coli virulence profile. Narhal does this work all the time with E. coli strains using the nanopore system. And with that data, he very quickly can put together a detailed risk assessment for our regulators to tell them what E. coli has, which virulence factors, and how dangerous or how worried should we be about this E. coli being in foods that are headed to the food supply. Sometimes, and you guys know, there are many E. coli's that we're not worried about. There are many E. coli's that maybe we might would be worried about, but we just don't know enough about them. But this type of sequencing approach is allowing us to have an a priori risk assessment approach, so much so that it's changed the way we do business that we use genomics to stand up a committee this year for the first time called the FSAC committee, which is the FDA STEC advisory committee of which Narhal is a member. And these, these scientists come together every time there's a contamination event and provide guidance to our compliance and outbreak officials on whether they should be going after this product or whether they should be trying to eradicate it from the food supply because we can get a good handle on threat, danger, and risk based on genomic data as an input. Very important. So whole genome sequencing is now routine at the FDA. We use it for compliance. We use it for all of our other agencies that we work with use it too. It will inform traceback investigations all of the time. It will delimit outbreak investigation scope and not just as a regulatory tool, it also will help industry with supply chain management, quality assurance and process evaluation. We, what we like best about whole genome sequences is that they're all portable and they're instantly agnostic. They will all work together and they all play nice together. And unlike PFGE, it's far more than a surveillance tool. It tells us lots of things about all these other adaptations that we never ever knew and would have all been separate tests up until the last few years. Now they're one test and that's a big deal. So I leave you with this to consider. In Canada, they've done an economic impact analysis for the, whole, the role of whole genome sequencing for food safety improvements. They found out that in Canada, they actually had um, about a, a $90 million savings in the implementation of whole genome sequencing just to reducing the cost and burden of salmonella outbreaks, the economic burden of salmonella. If you extrapolate those numbers to the United States, which are far larger and more complicated, you get a total burden of salmonella illness of about $3.3 billion annually. Those, those improvements brought on by sequencing calculate out to about $1 billion in savings. So for salmonella alone, you're talking about 30% reduction in cost and burden of illness. If you take those numbers across E. coli and the other main pathogens of bacteria that we can sequence, very quickly in the US food supply, you're talking about $10 billion from bacterial borne foodborne illness in the United States, which would calculate out to about three and a half billion dollars a year in savings to the consumer and to the United States government if we can implement whole genome sequencing on a national and global scale. So that's where we are. Uh, so looking to the future, nanopore is part of our future. It's dynamic, it's improving all the time. In conjunction with my seat, complementary sequencing, we're getting a lot of high quality closed genomes. It's very deployable, and that's what's very sexy about it uh, for identification and tracking. The long read metagenomics is also a real game changer for us. It will take us towards complete culture independent diagnostics as an agency. Very excited. The deployability for water testing and field food testing is absolutely huge. And finally, uh, we're going to need to learn more about detecting the limits of detection for the technology 
because that's all very important for any technology uses in food. So, so very exciting. So I want to thank Dr. Gonzalez, who's here in the audience. I shot him with the pointer. He's right here. Dr. Mark Allard, who helped us set up the genome tracker as our genomics coordinator for the agency. And my good friend, Ian, who was good to see, who he and I both, I see, uh, did a no-shave November. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you.